Johnson for his labor here and guiding this church through some perilous times. Holding the, holding the church together. You know, there's always, if I could say this, there's always buzzards sitting around waiting to see if it's going to die or not. It ain't dying. It's plenty of life. Amen. Amen. So we're glad for them. To have ever met Elder Triplett, we come here, I think, around 83 or 4, come back in 86. I think it was the last time we were here, 87. And um, went downstairs to eat. There was probably 100 preachers here. And Brother, Brother Triplett came over and sat down and ate with Brother and Sister Burbridge. And that left a lasting impression on me. And uh, had us uh, preach a few times here for him. And uh, we love that good man of God. And uh, we'd like to say we're thankful uh, for the nice room. Brother Epley has treated us royally since we've been here. Gave us a very nice car to drive. <laughs> and uh, accommodated us. We had to come in a day early and uh, apologize for that, but just the way it had to work out. But we're glad to be here. And I'm glad my son Houston, my youngest son, could come. He's my baggage boy and my doorbell boy and and get this and get that for dad. Sister Roberts would like to have been here, but she's been very, very sick, sickest I've seen her in 45 years. But um, a week ago tonight in prayer in church, the Lord really touched her and her health has been greatly improving ever since. And we're thankful for that. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'd like to thank all the good cooks. Racine's blessed with a lot of good cooks and good food and plenty of it. And, and uh, I did put in a suggestion that Brother Epley would get a round table somewhere for us big guys. <laughs> Amen. I said, I want to sit where Brother Triplett sat. I don't know if he's sitting in these booths or not. I guess if you're going to eat around here over in them booths, you're just going to have to lose weight. But the food was great. All the people were seemed, everybody was so happy. People was just so happy serving you. You think you was at Solomon's place. Amen. I believe in having happy church, don't you? Amen. The choirs have been good. We give honor to the choir leaders. That's a lot of work and challenge to uh, to get that singing all going like that, and and, and uh, we appreciate that. And and all the great men of God that's here, we honor you, and uh, thankful for the work that you're doing and. And uh, your steadfastness in the doctrine. And I uh, certainly appreciate what we heard from Elder Riggin. We're not Egyptians, and he let us know some of the differences. Amen. Thank God. Not all of Pentecost knows that, but right. we know that. And uh, Pastor Ham yesterday done a tremendous job talking about the synagogue, and he talked a lot about pride. And having more uh, care about the uh, acknowledgement of people than what God thought about us. And um, thought more of the praise of men than the praise of God. Tremendous Bible class. First time I ever met Brother Ham. And I was very impressed with his humbleness. Amen. Brother Couch last night just uh, just obeyed God. Matter of fact, I had a dream last night, and in my dream, Elder Epley, several people had called and had said they were healed. Amen. 
I text Brother Couch and told him about my dream. It's just a dream, but maybe there's something to it. Oh, he's he, and we're looking forward to hearing Brother Burgess tonight. He's uh, I think Brother Riggins said he felt like a mutt at a dog show. I feel like a mule at the at the uh, Kentucky Derby. <laughs> These preachers run fast. And they have done a tremendous job. And uh, we're going to go to the Word of the Lord for a few minutes. And um, something I'm seeing across the country, I believe it's of the devil, is a lack of response. I believe the devil wants you to come with a problem and leave the same way. Amen. But church to me is um, it's a it's a strong tower. It's a could I say it's a spiritual hospital? Yes, yes, yes. Well, you can you can get healed yes. mentally, yes. spiritually, physically, yes. in every way. Amen. He is the great physician. Amen. The Bible teaches us that he can do all that. The man that had lost his mind lived among the tombs. That was no problem for the Lord to restore his mind. Amen. We are dealing with people that have a lot of emotions in this hour right now. And um, we're going to go to the book of Genesis. And. Um, Chapter 2, and verse 18. You help me today. I, I want to be a blessing. I, I come to help. I, um, I'm going to turn the corner a little different today. That's all right. And uh, I... Uh, I don't know any, I, I'm not an educated man, I don't know any big words, and I'm certainly not, I wish I had more education. I encourage education. There's nothing wrong with it, you know, there's, and, um, but whatever the Lord does here today, he'll have to do it, because it's just not in my ability to, to do it. But God wants to help us. I know what I'm going to be preaching about today is here. I know it's here, and the Lord is here to help. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see. what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmate for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked and man and his wife and were not ashamed. I'll give you a title later on. You can be seated. Amen. Marriage is a very, very sensitive thing yes, it is. to God. And one of God's greatest projects and the thing, one of the things he thinks the most about in humans is the family unit. That's right. 
families. The homosexuals are a dying breed. Pardon the pun. We believe in father, mother, sister, and brother. We believe in the family unit. I'm going to tell you a little, I'm going to be a little transparent about my bringing up. I was raised in a very dysfunctional home, uh, a family that did not work. I mean, my parents were hard workers, but it was a it was a very difficult time in my life to be raised. And, and my mother was 25, and my father was 42 when they got married, and my dad was 47 when I was born, and I was the oldest of five. And uh, we was raised very poor, didn't know it because everybody around us was poor. And um, we, uh, I was often sent to uh, foster parents while my parents worked out of town. And so it was a troubling, confused time for me. It was no structure, no uh, guidance much. My dad was a man that uh, he had a love for God, but we weren't really church people. In the home I was raised in, there was very little affection. The word love was not anything used there. Um, way up in my 40s, I began to tell mom and dad that I love you when I talked to them on the phone, but they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't say that back. It was just not a part of their vocabulary. They was, their parents was that way. It was a very, they were very unaffectionate people. And um, dad, dad was jailed a few times for uh, my whippings. And uh, I probably deserved them. My, my dad, he raised and broke horses, and, and uh, he often uh, would whip me like he whipped his horses. And, um, you know, there's, uh, there's hatred that can get in the heart of just a young child in uh, living in these, this type of an environment. And... Uh, my parents separated three different times, and uh, one time while my mother, my father was at work, he had raised from one cow to a small herd of Hereford cattle, and it worked very hard to have that. And while he was at work, my mother called a uh, cattle buyer and came and loaded every cow that my dad had and uh, called a moving company, came and loaded every, nearly every stick of furniture we had. When my dad came home, he had nothing. He had no wife, no children. He had no, did not know where we were. He had no furniture in the house. He had all his cattle, everything was gone. And uh, we as children watched this happen and uh, kids love their dad. Yeah. And kids love their mother. Yeah. And they get caught in this transition of back and forth. And, uh, but my dad, I could never really uh, understand, but uh, he would come, he come and, and got us back. And it was never an ongoing conversation of what had happened. It was never brought up. My dad just started over again. And uh, keeping the family unit together was important to him. And uh, so I left home at the age of 16 years old and got a job working midnights in a gas station, finished high school. 
And uh, a preacher, an apostolic preacher, took me in when I was just a boy, gave me a place to stay. I wasn't in church, and uh, some of you would know him if I mentioned his name. But uh, along the way, along my journey, God has had his hand in my life, taking care of me here and there. And uh, we, uh, Sister Burbage and I got married at the age of 18. Uh, this is, we preach against what happened to me, but first time I was ever to an apostolic church, I was 14 years old. And Sister Burbage come walking in the classroom, a young 13-year-old girl. And I said to myself, there's the girl for me. And, uh, and uh, I got to Holy Ghost when I was 14, but I never went to church or lived for God till I was 25. God kept us together through all those years. Five years we were faithful. Only girlfriend I ever had. I married her two days after she turned 18. We're getting ready to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. Praise God. We're living in a different hour. When a lot of people want to play the field, they, they have affections for this one for a while and then they jump around and it's, it's all over the place. That's, there's no structure to that. There's no foundation in that. That's, that's that probably just lust. Marriage will not solve. It is not the answer to lust. Amen. And so we've been married for a long time. And I married a good girl. She already knew how to cook, clean. Children come by. She knew how to take good care of our boys. And I'm my daughter. We have six grandchildren. And um, so the Bible said, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And I feel like I have been well favored by my companion. But uh, what I talked about, my parents were not in church. But we are. We are. We're blood bought, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. You have a Holy Ghost filled companion, you have an advantage in this life. You have a great advantage. You have a gift from God. Amen. And uh, my parents both later on in life was baptized, received the Holy Ghost. My father received the Holy Ghost when he was 80. I wish he had got it earlier. Been a lot easier on me. He lived to be 97. And, uh, and so I have some good memories. But I thank God that when I was a, a sinner and far from God, and about to lose everything I had, I walked into an apostolic church. And there was a preacher there that wasn't afraid of my person or who I was, told me I was no good. And where I was heading, me and my little wife made it to an altar of prayer. God filled us with the Holy Ghost 33 years ago. And we thank God for that miracle. Miracle. Amen. So women, women are a great advantage uh, to a man's life. It was the woman's idea to make the prophet a little chamber on the wall and give him a, a, a table and a bed and a, a stool and a candlestick. She said, so that he shall turn in hither. It was her idea to make a place for the preacher in her home. Amen. She was a homemaker. Yes. Praise God. Some, there are some ingredients that have to be in a successful home. And one of those is there has to be room for the man of God. I knew of a preacher one time. He said he went to visit some saints. And uh, he was a large man. He said he looked around at the furniture and there was really no place for him to sit. He said, so I just stood and held my hat 
And uh, he said, the people, I could tell they was uncomfortable because I didn't have anywhere to sit. He said, but I went back later and they had made a two by 12 bench and set it in their living room. And he said, I went over and sat on that and I was so comfortable and so happy that they'd made provisions for me to sit in their home. I'm telling you, we need to be, our home needs to be open door to the man of God at any time he decides to stop by. There don't have to be, there doesn't need to be any last moment rearrangements or he should have the liberty to stop in anytime. He's a, he is a part of your family. He is a big part of your family. Amen. It was a widow woman that God used to sustain the prophet during the drought. God told the prophet, I have prepared a widow woman. Amen. It was a widow woman that brought the last meal that she had for the man of God. A woman is a great advantage. Amen. Amen. Women served in the early church. Paul said, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that you, that you assist her in whatsoever business she have need of you, for she hath been a secure of many and of myself also. It should not be a problem for the racing church to assist Sister Epley in whatever need or business that she has to do. You need to make sure you take good care of Elder and Sister Epley. Praise God. Amen. Paul wrote and he said, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Greet Mary also who bestowed much labor on us. Notable women in the Bible. Uh, one was named Ruth. Her name meant a female friend. Ancestress of David and our Lord Jesus Christ. Hannah means favor, the mother of Samuel. Abigail means my father rejoices, one of David's chosen wives. Praise God. Esther, chosen to be queen, chosen by the king. Mary Magdalene, it means fortress delivered from seven demons. She remained at the cross until Jesus' death, waited till the body was taken down, wrapped in a linen cloth and in the tomb. Elizabeth, Martha, Dorcas, Lydia, of course Mary, the mother of Jesus. Women were the first at the cross. Amen. Were the last at the cross and the first at the tomb. I don't want you to forget all those good things I said about women. Praise God. Amen. They are often the ones that start the prayer meetings. I don't know who this sister was that was praying over here, but I commended her. I said, that's the kind of praying I believe in. That's the kind of praying that we have in Middle Ridge going on. Not here to talk about my church. But I'm telling you, women is often the ones that start prayer meetings. I would to God that... I'm telling you, if prayer is still important, women, if you're prayer warriors, go back to work. Men, if you're prayer warriors, go back to work. This church still needs prayer warriors. Don't lose that. Much of the work in God's kingdom has been done by women, fundraisers, cleaning, all kinds of things. But I want to talk to you today. My title will be, What Does It Take to Make a House a Home? Right. Amen. What does it take to make a house a home? Praise God. Proverbs 14 and 1 said, Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. Every 
every wise woman buildeth her house. A build a house, Webster said, is a building for human beings to live in. It is a building where a group of people live as a unit. That's what a house is. But he said a home is a place where one likes to be. You can't buy a home. You can buy a house, but you can't buy a home. A home is something that has to be built by the people who live in it. Amen. There's a lot of houses on the market. They don't advertise them as homes for sale as usual. Houses for sale. Amen. And so it is also a restful, congenial place. Also means a comfortable, a place to be at ease, a home. I wish I was raised in a home, but we weren't an apostolic people, but you are. Amen. There's no reason why apostolic people ought to be living in a house when they can be living in a home. God. Down below home, there's a word called homey. Homey means having qualities associated with making a house a home, such as comfortable, friendly, and cozy. That's a home. It's a comfortable, friendly, cozy place to be. A homemaker is in the dictionary. And it says a homemaker is a woman who guides or manages a home. She guides. Amen. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, I will therefore that the younger women would marry, bear children, and guide the house, and give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. A good homemaker uh, creates an environment for a lasting marriage. Hey Amen. I don't know how many people in here today are living in a house, but I know there's some in here. But I'm going to tell you one thing, that house can become a home with a good man of God behind the pulpit teaching you how to love one another, respect one another. There is no reason why our dwelling should not be homes and not just a place for a group of people and a, un- a unit of people, just a, just a dry, cold dwelling. Amen. A good home is where children's lives are molded. Children's lives are often made or broken, become successful or ruined in that home. Praise God. Should be a place of balance and peace and love and harmony in that home. Praise God. A home is a place where submission and order are not bad words. The man is still the head of the wife. She is still to submit herself to him. Amen. Sarah called Abraham Lord. Men that men that will put their wife over their knee and whip them is crazy. Did I say that in Missouri? I said men that whip their wives like children are crazy men. She's not your daughter or your sister. She is your God-given companion. Someone that has the Holy Ghost. Amen. She is your homemaker. She is trying to provide an environment where you can be happy and a place where you want to come home. There's a lot of men today that don't want to go home, but they're not apostolic men. But you're apostolic, and your home should be a place where you want to be. A 
man that have found a wife have found a good thing and obtained favor of the Lord. Oh, yes. Amen. Yes, yes. Amen. A man that has a good wife, he receives better things in life than the ones that don't. A wife should be an asset to you. Praise God. A wise woman will guide her house with discretion, making right choices and wise decisions. Amen. She buildeth her house to promote the best for her husband. Shame on a woman that thinks other men are better than her husband. Shame on a woman that'll brag on another man more than she would her own husband. He comes home with calluses on his hands and he's put a hard day's work in. Hey man, you ought to greet him at the door with a big smile. Let him know, honey, you're home now. The day's done. I want you to be comfortable. The reason some men don't want to go home is because they don't have anything good to go home for. We have an epidemic in Pentecost called divorce. Something causes that. I'm telling you, a bad environment in the home. A man can only take so much nagging. A woman can only take so much verbal abuse. Don't you try it. Don't you go there. Don't you think just because you're sitting in church that they'll always just take that. There's been thousands in the last few years that have walked away. It's your responsibility, sir. It's your responsibility to man to make that house a home, a place where you want to be, a cozy, warm, comfortable, with a good environment. Not everybody gets a divorce just because they met somebody out of lust or whatever. It's a shame. But there's probably a lot of abuse that goes on in apostolic homes. Your home is not to be a war zone. I might just get away from my notes here. I've seen a lot of people come to church with their best face on and their best foot forward. But behind closed doors, they're not that way. They got problems. I'm telling you, I know the problem solver. I'm telling you that one of the devil's most best set keeper secrets is don't tell nobody on me. Don't tell nobody, hey man, how much disturbance and disruption I've put in your marriage. Don't tell nobody how unhappy you are. Don't tell anybody what kind of conditions you're living in. I'm telling you, conditions can be changed. Hey man, that environment can be changed by the help of the Holy Ghost. What's it take to make a house a home? Amen. That woman's that woman's touch. I'm glad I, it's not left up to me to decorate the house. It'd just be deer heads and fishing. My Lord, Sister Burbage got that special touch. Just knows where to put everything. And, you know, the couch don't, it gets moved around pretty often in the chairs and all. 
Everything's always moving around and changing. And that's a woman who has a desire to keep that house a home. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Always cleaning and got something good cooking. Yes. Yes. Got some uh, good smelling fragrance going on in the house. Yes. Yes. It don't smell like a roadside rest. Oh, well, praise the Lord. I went to pray for a man one time, and uh, he was in bed with his, he was a mechanic in bed with his clothes on. He was greased from head to toe, but he's under the covers. There was cats on the table, cats under the table. It was a filthy mess. I'm telling you, that does not qualify. That does not Bible qualify for a home in an apostolic church. Shame on anybody that would live like that and call theirself a Christian. Mary and Martha were housekeepers. Jesus, well, Jesus went in there and he found it a comfortable place for him to be. Well, pray, I hope I don't get this lopsided today because it's easy to do. But a woman at a work and clean the carpet and keep everything clean. A, a man that walk in with mud all over his boots and tracked her through the house and back out of the house. He ain't got no sense. He don't know what he's doing. That ain't the garage and that ain't the bar. That's not your house. That is your home. You respect her and respect her work. Most men could not do what a woman does in a day's time. That's right. Well, that's right. Oh, this is good. You're right. You're so right. My mother, we had no inside plumbing at all. Five kids, we was raised in a 20 by 20 house. That's pretty small. My mother had my brother John, and 11 months later, she had a set of twins with no running water, scrub board for the diapers. Any of y'all ever seen one of them? Hang the diapers beside the fireplace to dry out. All we had was linoleum. We didn't even know there was such thing as carpet. Mother would mop that floor, make them beds. In a small house like that with a big family, you got to stay on top of being organized. Anybody ever heard that word organized? That's what your house is supposed to be, organized. The kitchen's over here. The dining room's over here. The living room's over here. The bedroom's over here. Everything's organized. You don't eat your supper in the bedroom. We still believe in the family gathering around the supper table where dad says grace. That's a part of the home, friends. The devil wants to take that away from us, but we're going to keep it. Wife, wife, fix a big roast dinner with all the trimmings, and you you call and say you're going to be late. You got a you got a whopper at Burger King. You need to get a whopper when you get home. Some of you are looking at me like, what's he going to say next? He's got me pinned right now. I'm telling you, this is a part of apostolic doctrine, cleanliness, organization, a home, a comfortable place, not just a place for people together. Amen. A wise woman will render her family 
respectable, husband well dressed, children clean. You see a man, you see a man with a shirt on, it looks like he just got out of the bottom of a garbage can. That reflects on her. Hey, you represent your church everywhere you go. Praise God. She ought to, if we're getting ready to go to church, she ought to take a look at him. Make sure he got his shirt buttoned up straight. And as you get older, she's got to really look at you. Make sure you ain't got enough hair in your ears to grow potatoes. Well, praise God. Thank God for a good woman that watches over us. I'm going to tell you what. I'm putting off the days as long as I can. Will you get the sweatpants pulled up to here? And you got the Velcro tennis shoes on and you ain't got no teeth and you're laid back. I'm going to fight that long as I can. And I got a good wife and he's going to help me fight against it. My God, I'll tell you what, it's a beautiful thing to see an old man come to church well dressed. His shoes are shined. He's got his suit and tie on and that little lady sitting behind her behind him and she has made him proud them children them children come got them little suits and ties on got them pretty little dresses on did you see them kids up here last night wasn't they pretty Somebody taking good care of them. But I'll tell you what, an apostolic mama ain't gonna let her babies go around with snot all the way down under their chins. Their hair ain't been brushed out for a week. They got dirt under their fingernails and toenails. Well, praise God. That ain't that ain't apostolic. I said that ain't apostolic. Don't like it or not. It's not apostolic. God never to look like that. God called us to be clean on the inside and clean on the outside. A while back they was having a pizza party somewhere and one of the kids found a hair in the pizza. They said, they said, oh, there's a hair in this pizza. Another little kid across the room said, Give it to me, I'll eat it. We're country. <laughs> so I say you can't even be country if you can't eat a hairy pizza. <laughs> we don't do that no more. We're apostolic people. We, we, we're not the ones that ride on the little yellow bus. Hey man, we're not mentally retarded. All we had was bib overhauls to wear. They ought to be clean, and I've even seen them pressed. Praise the Lord. You be thankful for what you got. God will give you something better. Amen. Praise God. A wise woman builds up her house, builds up her house. Little by little through the years, she accumulates things and saves things and takes care of things and build, building that house up, making it a home. Come on. You 
You know, kids, when you, when you work for things and you, you finally get the living room suit you wanted, or you get the dining room suit you wanted, you don't let the kids just come running, kicking, playing ball and swinging bats and jumping over the table. Oh, sir. Yeah. You work for that. That's right. That's your home. That's right. Kids that are raised in that environment, I had to fight it. When I come to church, got married, I had no clue how to treat a wife. All right. Oh, I thought was well, she just cook and clean and, and I coon hunt all night. <laughs> Fish. And, but when I got in an apostolic church, yeah. somebody taught me, you're not an Egyptian. Yeah. You don't live like the world lives. You're not a heathen. Yeah. You're different. You're clean. You're holy. You're separated. You're organized. Brother Epley told me, he said, I know what I was getting when I called you so. That's exactly right. But I'm telling you, God gave me an, up, an upgrade yeah. when I come in the church. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Oh, Lord, we were so. Whew, it's bad. But that woman, she's a, she is a wise Money manager. All right. All right. All right. Some women can haul it out the back door on a teaspoon quicker than a man can bring it through the front door on a coal shovel. Don't look at me like I'm probably talking to you. That is not, his paycheck is not your allowance. It is your living. Yeah. Tithing comes out of that first. Yeah. Offerings come out second. Yeah. You pay your bills. Yeah. Right. You buy your food, your clothing. Pleasure and luxuries are at the bottom of the list, my friends. People that go on vacation on credit cards, I'm going to tell you what, you just ain't got old enough yet. Somebody said you don't start living until you're 40. Well, there's a lot of truth in that. You can't live like somebody that's worked for 30, 40 years and you've only been out there since you was 25 years old and you're trying to, you're trying to live like a man that's, that's worked for 40 years. Come on now. You can forget that mess trying to keep up with somebody else. I'm telling you, a wise money manager now, and that man, I'm telling you, he can't be a spendthrift. Uh, he don't and pole and a new gun every time he goes to town. Well, y'all was with me. You men was with me till right now. When you're behind on your bills, you have a priority. You go to, you go to church where the bank is. Where you pay your bills. Man that won't pay his bills, he ain't got, he not even qualified to be in the pulpit. That's a We lead by example. If your pastor sets you down because you can't manage your money. And you spend it on pleasures instead of on your bills. And he sets you down from whatever, whatever position you're in. Ain't nobody's fault but yours. Don't blame him. You disqualified yourself. But there ain't no excuse for that. In an apostolic church, uh, amen, where God has blessed you. Right. That's good, preacher. This is so 
Praise the Lord. You know, some people live out of the dollar store. They, they do, they get out there every day and buy their dinner. Or they go, they go eat out every day. Figure that up at the end of the month. My wife, since she was, we was married, she, she makes a, a menu Monday through Sunday. I can look on the fridge and tell you what we're going to have. And she goes, to the, she goes to the grocery store and buys that stuff for them meals. And if I get in her cheese for tacos, I'm in trouble. She guides that house. She manages those cupboards. She manages that refrigerator. And she keeps money in my pocket. People spend four or $500 a month eating out. You're going to have to be awful wealthy to do that, I think. I, would, I don't know if I'd do that if I was wealthy. Well, shout now, somebody. This will help you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. How much is she worth? You can't put a price on it. And you know what? When them grandbabies comes to grandma's house, she's boss. They don't just get in the refrigerator and drag stuff out. There's a thing called permission. I got I got boys that's late twenties, early thirties. They, they don't they don't don't get in the refrigerator. All right. They say, Mom, is it all right if I get this? Cause Mom guides that house. Yeah. Mom guides that refrigerator. God, Mom guides what's in them cupboards. Yeah. 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 Amen. Amen. I got a grandson. He likes Twinkies, and she have a box of them in the cupboard. And there were a couple of times he got in there and eaten just about all of them. She said, now, now, Clayton, you ask. And if Grandma wants you to have one, she'll give you one. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Many, many have, many wives have had a good home. And they've let it go back to a house. Listen, just listen. Somehow that homey, comfortable, friendly, cozy home become a cold, dark cave where nobody wants to be. Ain't always been that way. You know what that's called? Backsliding. You know what that's called? Unthankfulness. Amen. A foolish woman don't know. She don't know. It's getting too late to recover it. That's true. That's right. She's plucked it down with her own hands. Tore it down. My God, how many, how many appreciates home God has given you? Amen. Debt is a big pressure on marriages today. I didn't realize till my daughter graduated from high school years ago. Fashion Bug, Sears, J.C. Penney's. Whatever else you can think of, all started sending her credit cards. She didn't even have a job, but they knew I had one. <laughs> if you can't pay that credit, this just Elder Epley can change anything he wants to. I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> Don't blame him for anything I say. I take the credit for all of it. A credit card is a good thing 
for a paper trail. But if you can't pay it off at the end of each month, you're probably better off just to go cash. Just letting it go a little bit each month. For in two or three years, you'll be so far in debt and have nothing to show for it. I was down in North Carolina one time. A guy approached me and said, I want to take you and Sister Barbara job for dinner. And he pulled out this thing and, and opened it up and the credit cards unfolded to the ground. And he said, I got a little space left on this one right here. $40,000 in debt on credit cards. That's retarded. How are you ever going to pay that off with the kind of interest they charge? 23, 24%. That's not for apostolic people. That's not us. That's for the Egyptians. We ain't going to let financial, financial trouble bring our marriages in bondage. Bring us to church with a long, sad face. You don't think it affects people. It does affect them. Affects their prayer life. Affects the way they worship. Affects their love for everybody. My mother, bless her heart, and my, my dad, he, poor as we was, he carried two or $3,000 in his wallet. He didn't spend no money. She'd get up in the middle of the night and steal out of his wallet to buy us kids clothes, you know, and things we needed. Somehow, she got credit from J.C. Penney, and she started buying clothes and things we needed. Well, she didn't have no way to, she, she couldn't steal it fast enough to pay for it. Back then, we had what they called bill collectors, and they'd come and knock on the door every day. She'd hide us kids under the, under the bed and say, be real quiet till he leaves. But she wasn't in an apostolic church. Dad wasn't in an apostolic church. Hey, nobody in here ought to have to hide their kids under the bed because the bill collectors is coming. When you sit in an apostolic church, that's what the Egyptians do. And I'm just going to borrow that today. We've been taught. I'm telling you, the devil's in the binding business. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's in the ruining, the stealing. Yes, yes. He'll say, now you can't afford to pay your tithes. You used to give this much in the offering, but, well, you've got bills now. You see what the devil's done? You don't never get yourself so financially obligated. You don't have no more liberty to give to missions or support your church. Well, it didn't go over real good, but that's the truth anyhow. I'm going to say something here today and, and, and just, just the way I felt. Brother Epley said the missionary offering Wednesday night was $1,400. I thought that was sad. All right. He thought it was good. <laughs> he was just trying to be nice. I thought that was sad. Out of a crowd of, how many is here? 400 people? $1,400? In a little church of uh, 90 people, we took up 26,000 the other night. All right. All right. Not that night, but they came in in a short period. I'm telling you what, when you, when you have lost... Your love and revelation for giving. Your pockets are going to empty out. You're going to reap what you sow. If you don't sow nothing, you ain't going to reap nothing. I don't care what the economy is. You still should give according to your ability. Well, I didn't have to say that, but it was on my heart. Praise God. Folks, I'll tell you what, they give a dollar and five dollars in the offering 
20 years ago, 30 years ago. Hey, Amen. You can't outgive God. You know that, don't you? You can't outgive God. God, God will bring it back to you, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. Given still right. Given it shall be given. He said, I'll make you the head and not the tail. I'll put you above and not beneath. I'll best your basket coming and going. Bible said they, they robbed me. Tithes and offerings. Reason people can't give is because of what I've been talking about. They now manage their finances. He said, he said they are cursed with a curse. I've seen people come in and God just bless them. Nice cars, good jobs, nice homes. And all of a sudden they got upside down and they quit giving dishonest with their tithe. Tithing is still a tenth. If you give an eighth, that's not tithing. That's not tithing. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Lift your hands and love the Lord for just a minute. Thank God. Pentecost is still, I think we still have the foundation intact. It's, right. right. it's firmly laid. It ain't going nowhere. All right. But we've got bad structure problems. Oh, yeah. I was at a friend of mine's house one time and he said, you see that house over there? And I said, yeah. And he said, they put the foundation in and they, they had it all stick framed all the way up. And the zoning inspector come and said, you know, you, you have put, I'm just saying that I didn't know all the details, but you, you have put two by eights where there should have been two by tens. You've put two by tens where there should have been two by twelves. We got a structure problem here. This is not going to hold this house. Disassemble it. That man made them disassemble a whole house. No, there was no siding on just the structure. And build it over. I'm telling you, people don't like the zoning inspector. But he's your friend. He'll keep your house from falling in on you. Some people don't like the preacher when he gets to meddling in their business and telling them how to live and how to manage their money and how to treat each other, how to raise their kids. But I'm telling you, he's going to keep your house from falling in on you. All right. Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. A wise man dig deep and lay his house on a rock. But the foolish man built his on the sand. And when the storm coming, it will come. Great was the fall of that house that was built on the sand. People that sit and listen to good apostolic preaching, but they never apply it to themselves. They never take it out them doors and do anything with it. Your house will come to ruin. You are right. Praise God. Structure damage in the marriage. Lawyers took a survey and they said 80% of divorces are caused from Facebook. I know I'm going to, I know I'm getting in the middle of something here right now, but if them Egyptian lawyers can tell us what's wrong with our church, I guess we need to listen to them. I'm not 
technically savvy. I have no interest in it. And that's a blessing to me. And I know everybody from Santa Claus to the greatest prophet is on there. But they said how that happens is, you know, I'm going to tell you something. I, I didn't know this till I got here, but when you're getting close to 60, you still need all the help you can get. It don't get easier when you get older. In fact, I hate old age. I don't hate old age people. I just hate old age. <laughs> I've already clarified that. I don't like old age. I hope to live all, long enough to get there. But I'm getting there. But I, I, I found out. I asked a man one time in our church, he was getting close to 80 years old. He had been a Navy officer in the submarines. And I said, Brother Humphrey, I said, at your age, I would look at you. I'd think you don't have a problem in the world. I can't see how lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the prior life would even affect you. <laughs> well, hello. It still does. I said, Brother Humphrey, being a naval officer, I said, what's your biggest battle? He surprised me. He said, submission. Glory. Submission. I never would have dreamed it. He never showed it, but it was his battle. But they said the reason so many divorces off of Facebook, and that's probably Facebook is probably a, an old program by now. But they said when a man gets in his 40s or 50s, he gets to thinking about his old high school flame. All right. And now it ain't no more, now it ain't no more a passing thought. He can get on there, look her up and see her and find out where she lives, talk to her. Right. Activity on social networking with the opposite sex. I'm going to tell you what. The internet has brought Pentecost from the Holy Ghost and fire to a cool breeze. She always got some idiot it's out there flirting around with pornography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you what, you, you, you play with pornography, you're an adulterer. Yeah. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. You're unfaithful to your wife. You're a scallywag. That's right. You need to get on an altar. You need to get rid of it. If you can't handle it, get rid of it. Save yourself. It ain't just men and women, women on there. Hours. Dishes are stacked up this high. Laundry ain't been done for two weeks, and they're on the internet. Well, I'm just country. I don't eat hairy pizza, but I'm country. But I'm telling you what, when we come into church, God changed us. We was born again. Yeah. Old things pass away, and behold, all things have become new. The old man died. Thank God pornography was one thing I was never involved in, even in the world. I respected my wife. All right, all right, all right. I'm telling you, there's a strong spirit behind that. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. 
You can't even pick up a J.C. Penney's. A man can't even pick up a J.C. Penney's catalog and look through it now. That's right. That's right. That's right. Everything's naked. That's true. That ain't us. Praise the Lord, everybody. Thank God. And casual texting to another spouse. I, I got on something here in a camp meeting while, some time ago, and it, they kind of laughed at me about it. And I'm telling you, we, we preach against texting to another man's wife or her to another man's husband and just chit chat. We preach against that. Well, they got to playing games back and forth. I thought of texting and chit chats wrong. You gonna play, you gonna play, a, you gonna play a game for 20, 30 minutes with another man's wife? I tell you it's wrong. I say it's wrong. It stirs up lust. It leads to no good. We got enough to fight without that. Leave it alone. This is some of the structure problems we have. This is why we haven't such a challenge with divorce today. Women used to be modest in clothing and modest in spirit. If a woman considers herself pretty, she don't need to dress in a way that would make that even more obvious. I can't stand these knee knocking right. hooker heels, right. knee, knee knocking skirts. And there's a spirit goes with that. Here now, wa waddling all, all the way down, down the aisle. You can see every hump and bump. Look like two cats in a gunny sack. A boy that won't pray and he won't worship, he won't get behind his preacher, and not be no girl even consider him. He don't pray before he gets married, he won't pray after he's married. This is some of the structure damage uh, we're dealing with in this generation. There's a generation that curses their father and does not bless their mother. Amen. Praise the Lord. People get to talking. I preach we need to fellowship, but not a lot. And especially with the same couples. You get to talking too loosely. You get to talking about private things that should never be talked about. A woman or a man should never discuss their private life with somebody else. Or exchange pictures that I know has been done. That's low down. That's dirty. That's the Egyptians. That's not us. We're apostolic people. Oh, you can't get with me, but you want me to shout with you. I'll just stir that up a little bit. Any man that would let in modesty sit on his pews and don't say nothing about it, he better examine his own heart. From 
the sound man to the preacher man. Praise the Lord. Any woman that a man would make a little remark to her, she certainly has our permission to put him in his place. She put him in his place. He won't be back. Hallelujah. This is our church. This is our life. This is how we live. If you want to live like that, go back to the bar where you come from. Praise the Lord. Oh, thank the Lord. Lift your hands and love the Lord. I'm... Some people have been under so much pressure, they've given up hope. That's right. That's right. They don't clean their house no more. They don't cook no more. They sit down. They quit. The man, for whatever reason, he's quit looking for a job. He sit down. He quit. He don't mow the grass. He's got 15 junkers sitting around his house. He's quit. But I'm telling you, in an apostolic church, there's no reason to quit. Get back up. Get back up. Clean that house. Mow that grass. Go get a job. Wash them dishes. Wash them clothes. Lift up holy hands. Love God. Come to church. Pray. Worship. God will bring you out. God will bring you out. Ships, uh, turn you against each other. Don't let the devil do it to you. You get behind closed doors and you start fussing and fighting. I told my church, I said, you get in an argument, you do not call each other animal names. One brother said, Pastor, can I call her dear? <laughs> said, you can call her deer, but don't you call her goat. <laughs> hey, man. Behind closed doors is what you really are. You be measured and judged not so much about how you do in here. Judgment begins at the house of God. But what you do out there in your home, how you treat each other, how you speak to each other, How you love your children. Praise God. Amen. Pastors that have church problems, and we often do. Sometimes that pressure gets into our homes. It's not just the saints that get get unruly, get too loud. Get agitated, irritated, start saying things you shouldn't say. We're humans too. Somewhere we got to put the brakes on it. She didn't cause that church problem. Come to find out later, it was a lie. Nothing to it at all. I apologized to him then. He's 30 some years old now and just recently I apologized again to him for that. But it wasn't just a few years down the road, that woman, she had a, a daughter and a son, a daughter and a, and a daughter. 
ran under a semi and was killed. That ain't funny. That ain't funny. And I'm going to tell you something right now. False accusing ain't funny. You got pressure. You, you got a problem with your pastor. Leave his wife alone. Leave his kids alone. You ain't man enough or woman enough to go to him and talk about it. Leave his family alone. God ain't going to like you for that. Been a lot of preachers' wives have sat down and nearly quit. And nearly begging their husband to quit pastoring. I got news for the devil, we ain't quitting. And mama's gonna get back up. Oh yeah. God's gonna help us. This is his church. Our people, thank God, they accommodate us, help us in every way. They go above and beyond what would be required of them to take good care of Brother and Sister Burbage. I hope you're doing the same for your pastor, whoever he is. Praise God. You might be in prison or in the graveyard or be divorced if it wasn't for the good man of God. Marriage, from what I can read in the Bible, it's one wife. One wife. One wife. One wife for life unless she dies. That's not a popular message anymore. That's a dying message. But I'm telling you how serious it is. Better find someone. You know, we don't believe in pin pal marriages. We don't believe in finding somebody through texting. We believe in meeting that person, talking to that person, talking to their family, talking to that pastor. We're going to talk it through. We're going to ask questions. That's good. That's right. Praise the Lord. That's good preaching, Thank the Lord. Why don't we just put the ax to the root of all this structure problem I'm talking about? Amen. Tell on the devil. Tell on the devil. There, you know, there, there, comes, <laughs> there comes what they, they call midlife crisis where the man buys the Corvette. Yeah. He's got it as bad as she has. Yes. But I'm telling you, I had a few experiences with it. Emotions yes, yes. can get all messed up. Sure can, brother. I'm not going to be real transparent here today, but I'm, I'm telling you, they can get it all messed up. We had a woman that had surgery, had to have surgery in the church. I'm telling you, when she came out of it, she was a totally different person. She wanted to hold, her hand, hold hands with her husband all the time. Sit in church, hold him. He couldn't get out of her sight. After several years of marriage, this jealousy. A, I knew this woman for... 20 some years totally different uh, you, can, you can sit and say I don't have the problem and take it home with you but I still believe that prayer can help prayer is helping marriages that's in trouble prayer can still help that home that's in disarray marriage can and prayer can still help Oh, thank God. If that home has become a house, turn it around. Stop it. Let's stand, lift our hands. The musicians have come. Tell the devil, I'm not going back to that cold, dark, 
love. Honey, we're going back to our home. There might need to be some repenting and apologizing. I'm losing a lot of folks right now. They're going out the door faster than they're coming in. You want to go to heaven? You want to go to heaven? You can't do it fighting behind closed doors. You can't do it hating one another. You can't do it with bitterness and strife and envy in your hearts, in your marriages, in your home. You ain't going. I said you ain't going. Oh, yes. I say, nobody knows about this, sweetie, but me and you. God knows about it. God told on it today. We're apostolic people. We've been born again. We got a new life, a new beginning. The devil, if the devil has taken your home and turned it into a house, why don't you turn it back around and do something about it today? It'd be all right if a man got a hold of his wife and said, Honey, let's just go up to the front of the church and lift our hands and ask God to strengthen us and help our home. Don't worry about that old pride. Ain't nobody here but us. This is us. This is what we do. This is where we come for help. We don't go to the psychiatrist. We don't go to the marriage counselors. We come to God. We come to God. Praise the Lord. said, I'm not going up there. Everybody know I'm having trouble. Well, God already knows it. We ain't accusing nobody on the verge of divorce. We're just saying we need some strength and some help in our homes. In our spirits. In our prayer life. In our finances. We need to get reorganized. Somebody give us a little chorus. Let's lift our hands and love the Lord. Preacher, preach to me. If you come, we'll pray for you. Oh, preacher. If you come, we'll pray for you. This is how we get help. This is how Brother and Sister Burbage gets help. This ain't nothing to be ashamed of. We love God. That's why we're here. I must be saved. Preacher, preach to me. Preacher. Oh, God's going to help us. God is going to help us. If you're if you're single, your companion's not here, and you need help, why don't you come? Let us pray for you. You need strength. You need help. I'd like to ask for the ministers that would please come and help us pray with these couples. These are these are real problems. These are real people with a real need and God's going to help us. People with pressure. Pressure. Nerves are in bad shape.
preachers, help me. Pray for these people. Some of them are yours. <laughs>